And we're on, Dr. John Russin. Thanks for being on Fitness and Consciousness. Now nah, it's great to be here, man. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, I've been watching uh, your um, stuff on Facebook and uh, for a long time now. I don't, even, I don't even know how long. It seems like I've, I've just known about you for quite a while. And you're a, a physical therapist, and you work a lot with uh, like professional athletes of all sorts. And so I guess let's um, kind of start from uh, the the beginning. Like what what got you into fitness and why physical therapy instead of just like a, a personal trainer? Why like, why not just like strength coach or something like that? It's a really interesting question because I, I do get pigeonholed as the physical therapist. Uh, I don't actually view myself as a physical therapist. I am truly a strength and conditioning coach that happened to have an education in a doctorate of physical therapy. So I was a coach uh, at high school and division one level before I actually went to graduate school to get a DPT. And then my claim to fame in the industry is that I've never actually worked as a traditional physical therapist. I just continued on uh, coaching athletes, coaching my clients and doing it a little bit better, uh, a little bit more differently than the average coach, just because I had the license to diagnose. I had the license to put my hands on people if I wanted to do that. And it uh, kind of cleaned up some weak links in terms of the way that we continue to keep our athletes healthy and bulletproof to keep them on the field, on the court, and otherwise just healthier overall, even for our general fitness clientele. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, it seems like in, because I started as a trainer in, in 1999, and it seems like more, I guess it's been going on for, well, I don't know, like last decade or so. Um, guys like Gray Cook, who physical therapist, but now he, then he has uh, uh, certifications for our personal trainers to yeah. kind of bridge the gap a little bit. You're not a clinician yet, but you know a little bit of something that the clinicians are looking for. And so, like, uh, can you, I like, just kind of like describe like, what do you think it is that like, if you just have like the strength coach certification versus you know physical therapy, that's a lot of school. Um, like something that like kind of like bridges the gap. How would you bridge the gap? Well, it's something that I've been doing full time for the last two years here. So a vast majority of my time now is not working with athletes and clients in person any longer, but it's actually coaching coaches. So I've traveled the world, been on every single continent over the last two years, uh, really doing seminars and certification courses around the pain-free performance training model, which is exactly what you're talking about. It's trying to, again, I hate the term, but bridge that gap between physical therapy and performance training. But essentially what it comes down to is teaching coaches, teaching personal trainers how to better screen and assess their clients and how to more well organize their programs in order to achieve physical longevity, to take away pain within a scope of practice, and to otherwise get better performance out of any type of client or any type of athlete. And I truly believe that this is the future of fitness because we're having this injury incidence rate that is just sky high and it's getting worse and worse. You know, you look at the incidence of lower back pain that's been polarizing over the last decade plus, but we're starting to see uh, shoulder incidents of injuries rise, knees, everything seems to be going in the shitter. And we wonder why. And we have more education than ever before. We have more personal trainers. We have more fit people than ever before. We also have more non-fit people. But why are these people getting hurt? And I truly think it is what you're talking about. It's two allied healthcare professions, personal training and strength coaching on one side and more physical therapy, chiropractic, the rehab professions on the other side. And we're not learning from each other anymore. It's like two different camps. And this is the biggest misconception that I break down literally within the first five minutes of my seminar is that it's not only about personal trainers and strength coaches learning from physical therapists. Over this time teaching, it's really the other way around. We have a lot of clinicians that take my course and they take a huge amount away in the principles of strength conditioning. And I think if both of these allied healthcare professions can start not only coexisting, but actually synergizing together 
our clients, our athletes are going to start being healthier. People are going to start gaining longevity with any physical practice that they're after. And we're going to be moving in the right direction in terms of just generalized health and wellness. Yeah. So you're talking about in the, in the first five minutes, like what, what's the, uh, is there like a, like the aha mo moment or like, like the, like something that like one is, is missing, like the, you're talking about the physical therapists learning from the strength coaches who were, you know, they've been doing it and they've seen over and over again, this stuff working or not working or it's like, is, is there like something in, in particular that's really like in, like in, in the movement or in like the load or? I think that the, the reason that we have not only the injury rates that we have, but also the re-injury rates after people get reintroduced into sport and training is that we have an incomplete physical therapy or rehabilitation process. The biggest glaring link that I see time and time again from even some of the smartest clinicians in the world is that we're afraid to load people, use the parameters of strength and hypertrophy in the right way to actually get somebody to the point where we can have not only a mechanical stress into the system, which can cause muscular gains, strength gains, but also neurologically. When you think about really hard wiring a movement pattern, really owning a movement you can't just do it with body weight. You can't just do it with 20% of one RM. You know, there's two main ways that you can hardwire a movement pattern into your neuromuscular sequencing. You can challenge it by load, or you can challenge it by movement velocity, or you can mix those two things together. You know, many times in the rehab setting, we're not going to be doing advanced plyometrics with people or having them sprint down the, down the therapy halls. What we're going to be doing is having a need for loading. Loading is the thing that we need to appreciate, but we have to start working into a generalized uh, plan of care for each and every type of athlete that comes through. And it's the simplest thing in the world. It is almost too simple to be effective. And I think that's the reason, one of the main reasons that, you know, clinicians really, uh, they back off from loading their clients is that, Oh, oh no, I have a doctorate. Like I know way more about the human body than anything. It's way more complex, but when it breaks down, you know, there's two ways to challenge movement. And in order to actually get it to the point where we make a notable change in the way that we move, optimizing that movement. So not only we can get better performance, but we can really fend off pain for the long term. you know, it has to start with load. And that's the number one thing that I think the clinicians that attend my course get from it is that don't be afraid to load people. Loading is not inherently dangerous. Weight training is not inherently dangerous. If you really want to break down the research, if you really want to break down the science over the better part of the last hundred years, strength is the number one physical characteristic that can actually combat chronic pain and acute traumatic injuries. So that's a powerful thing for me, and that's kind of the statement that we make. Yeah, that's uh, that make, makes sense to me, and it, it's it's good to hear other people say that. My I'm uh, a strong first kettlebell instructor, and I study a, a lot of methods, but like it's called strong first for a reason, and like some of yes. like, like, uh, strong fixes a lot. Like I, I forget who said that exactly, but like it just um, like when I've like worked with a guy like um, um, like his like doing like walking carries like his like right foot would like uh, internally rotate. And so it's like, I'm could like start like guessing like all these like different muscles and stuff. But like when we're doing the stuff, just fix the movement and like get stronger, like in, like in like squatting and the lunging. Right. And then I can look brilliant without knowing all those little muscles and you know, I can name a good number of them, but to guess like which one is a firing right. And get, I could start guessing. I could like sound, sound right. But be yeah. way off. I could be way off and not and not be smart enough to know it. And you know, sometimes the, the curse of knowledge is what holds back our training. You know, we need to have big ticket items be the thing that takes the vast majority of our training focus. Mm -hmm. You know, a strong first guy that I love to learn from, uh, a good friend of mine, Brett Jones, mm -hmm. you know, he he almost plays it off as like, hey, I forgot what these muscles are called, but the movement pattern, and it's like this big running joke because, you know, really the pattern is the thing that shows us the true linkage 
of all the different regions of the body, the neuromuscular slings, the kinetic chain. And if we can treat the body as a unit, then the sky is the limit, not only taking people out of pain from literally a rep by rep basis, but optimizing performance. Uh, you know, my career has taken me a, a lot of different places, but in the last three years, uh, I live up here in Madison, Wisconsin now, I manage some of the strongest power lifters in the world, uh, you know, world record holders and some banged up people in general. And it's amazing what you can do by optimizing a motor skill or a movement pattern. You know, somebody who is literally has 30 years of training age, getting in and kind of reverse engineering a barbell bench press or a deadlift for them, it's revolutionary. You know, we didn't change the exercise. On paper, it looks like exactly the same shit, but executing it the way that it was meant to be executed is the biggest differentiating factor into having self-autonomy with moving pain-free for the long term. It's not about the exercises. It's about the way that you fit the exercises to the individual. So if we can appreciate that, we can coach those things, and we can bring as many, many different parts of the body into one movement pattern as we possibly can, then that's how we not only have success with barbell sport or putting somebody on a platform, but also with just uh, you know kind of fending off joint pain chronic wear and tear, that kind of stuff, because the goal is to train the muscles and really spare the joints. If we can do that, if we can really have that training focus, it seems super simple, but it's harder said than done. And that's why the profession of strength and conditioning exists. Yeah. So I get, would an example of that be like, uh, I, I've been lifting for a long time and I'm dead lifting and then my, my hips hurt, my back hurts. And you're looking at me like, well, you're uh, flexing your spine maybe go, maybe you need to start doing more of a sumo deadlift or something like that where I'm, I can keep my spine neutral and I can, is, is that what something you mean or? You know, sometimes, uh, even before we would change somebody from like a conventional pull to a sumo pull, you know, are you pulling like shit? Like, are you just butchering this movement pattern right now? Key um, step number one is try to optimize the movement pattern itself. More times than not, it's the actual execution. If you cannot outcoach somebody with internal, external cues, manual cues, whatever it may be, then it's time to dig down and figure out why. Why needs to come before we move somebody into a different type of pull or whatever it may be for whatever movement pattern. There needs to be a linchpin in the pattern itself or in somebody's control of the pattern that is causing this. And we go through the, the squat, hinge, lunge, push, pull, carry as our six foundational movement patterns. We also assess rotation, but a little bit differently. And really from doing this for over a decade now of actually assessing the movement patterns themselves, you tend to see the same weak link show up time and time again. So say, you know, you lose neutral spine in the deadlift. You probably lose neutral spine position in the squat. You're losing neutral spine position when you go single leg. You're losing neutral spine position when you're bench pressing. You're losing neutral spine position on the pull-up. The linchpin is usually going to show up across the board. Yeah. And that's something that is so easy. So instead of changing all six movement patterns, trying to chase the mythical beast, which is perfection in execution, we just need to figure out what that missing link is break it down, strengthen the missing link, and then I refer back to the reverse engineering process. Take things away and then reintroduce them back in, but just stronger that time. And that's something that does really, really well. You know, uh, going back to your specific question, you know, moving somebody from like a conventional pole to a sumo pole, you know, there are certain things that you, you can't outcoach. You know, there's certain anthropometrical variants in each and every person. So people are going to have different hip types, different femur lengths, different tibial shaft angles, stuff like that. Um, you know, different uh, synergies between uh, the five joints of their ankle complex. You got to know that stuff exists. But before you go in and start like deep diving in on the very isolated screening and assessment protocols, we have to be a coach first. We need to use our eyes. We need to use our guts. And we need to actually start coaching the movements. At that point, if you're a great coach and you still can't optimize the movement, that's the time to actually screen and assess more deeply. 
And that's really uh, what we teach in about 10 hours of our two day course. You're, uh, so you have the, you have two main different certifications. You're talking about the assessments and then you're talking about the, so is the, is it part of the same thing or it's, it's two different ones? So you're teaching like this. No, so I, I teach uh, one course It's called pain-free performance training system. It's a, it's a, it's a two day seminar and uh, that's been the, uh, the current seminar for the last two years, but it's been catching fire because again, it's a, uh, it's truly giving the trainer it's giving the strength coach what they weren't taught in their certification, what they weren't taught in school when they're doing their four year or their associates. And it's again, bridging that gap, but, Using what you are already inherently great at, I always say like a personal trainer or a strength coach or any movement professional, you've seen more movement than anyone else. So movement is your ticket into being a gold standard coach. So use movement to really scale how you would screen and assess after that. You know, it doesn't come before, it comes out of necessity after. And using, you know, again, 10,000 hour rule. Most personal trainers, if you're training full time, you get 10,000 hours within about three and a half years, which is like mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Any other profession, you know, you're looking at probably 10 years to get to that point, but looking at movement and the mastery of actually visualizing movement is something that almost every personal trainer that has a couple of years under their belt has. Now we just need to put a system on how to use that information that you're already great at looking at and systemize it in a way that you can screen and assess if need be to get better programming, better results for the clients. Yeah, that makes sense to learn how to, like, you see it, like you were saying, like the same thing, like losing neutral spine or something like that is going to pop up in a bunch of different techniques and then you can, um, you know, kind of figure out what's, what's going from there. And your uh, the one seminar, I thought you were like, at first you meant two, but the, the one that I, I've seen before that you did. Um, and it sounds like you have like that, you have the one and it's like this, like kind of a narrow focus, like kind of like narrow and, and deep. And what do you think about like when somebody's like starting out in fitness and they're on Instagram, they're scrolling, and my Instagram is full of um, people moving in all sorts of ways. There's all kinds of cool uh, methods from like B-Boy and yoga and like the move net and capoeira and just plain powerlifting. And so like if you're a, a coach, like if you're like advising like new coaches or even like coaches that have been around for a while, how do you uh, advise them to go about that when somebody sees all these different things? Like, what, kind of like, where do you start? That, that's a really good question. It's a question that I get all the time. Um, I'm a big believer that before you become a niche specialist, you have to be a great generalist. Why is somebody coming to pay you money to train them? in order to get sustainable results and actually learn something about their bodies. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily know what that person is going to be great at, what type of training methodology is going to resonate best with them mentally, physically. So you have to almost be giving somebody a little bit of everything at the start. And that starts the process of client management. So really we have to have a strong foundation across the board in the big physical principles. You know, you think about strength training, you think about mobility, endurance, you know, self-maintenance, all, all these different things. You have to be well-rounded enough to be able to pick and choose what you want to give a client on that day. And it becomes very clear pretty quickly that there's going to be certain things that you are inherently great at as a coach. It might be because you have a very, very interesting training background yourself. Maybe you're a division one baseball player and you really have a thing for the kinematics of the shoulder because you've been there. Or maybe you've been a professional dancer. So mobility was something that you worked on for the last 15 years of your life. And you know, that's something that you have this special talent at. So everyone has to find their special talent based off of 
not only their self experiences, but where they're investing their time and their money and their energy and their career capital. But I think that the biggest mistake that we see on Instagram or on any social media these days is people becoming specialists before they ever become a generalist. Mm -hmm. And it's almost the curse of knowing, not even knowing what you don't know. Everything exists out there to somebody, but you don't even know it exists because it's like, no, man, I'm, I'm the kettlebell guy. Oh, you're 18. Like you've never trained a client in your life. No, no. Kettlebells are the only way. And it becomes this dogmatic approach. I'm not making fun of kettlebells here. It could be anything. Hey, I'm a West Side guy. I'm a kettlebell guy. I'm a calisthenics guy. Like it could be anything. I'm only yogi. Like, mm -hmm. and then you forget that people don't give a shit what they do when they come into the gym with you. All they care is, is that they have a great time while they're there and they get results. So you have to be able to give somebody a little bit of something because if you can keep them highly motivated, if you can keep them consistent, then results become very, very easy as long as they stay healthy. So I think getting a start, you know, there's uh, certification boards that try to do this, you know, the NSCA, ACSM, there's many, many different ones. And I think there's a reason that they go through, uh, you know, some of these standardized testings, uh, you know, something like a, a CSCS or a certified personal trainer or something like that, because they try to give a little bit more of a well-rounded view, but it's not about the license. It's not about the credential. It's about what you do after you get it and really taking your due diligence of checking all the boxes for those big physical characteristics that really everyone has to have a piece of. You know, when I go through programming for general fitness clientele that just want to look great, they want to feel good on a daily basis, you know, they want to lose fat, they want to gain some muscle, and they want to gain sustainability for health and wellness for the long term, it becomes a very well-rounded program. You know, we're doing cardio, we're doing conditioning, we're doing mobility, we're doing strength training, we're doing a little bit of power training, we're doing hypertrophy work, uh, you know, we might be swimming in the pool, we might be walking outside, like... It's all about well-roundedness at that point. And the people that do the best long-term, you know, I'm talking about, you know, from 30 to 50, from 50 to 70, they're the ones that never let any of their physical characteristics get down to a piss poor level. Because as you get older, as you get more training age, it's really harder to bring up some of these physical metrics. Uh, a lot of the predominant strength athletes that I work with, uh, they have hated doing cardio or conditioning their entire careers. And then it comes to the point where they're 42 years old, they're 50 years old. And it's really hard to develop a cardio or conditioning capacity because again, they have 20 or 30 years of training age on them of wear and tear. And it's something that is always battling this uphill climb. And as long as we just are good enough at the base metrics of all metrics of strength, then it becomes very easy to get good at things and actually keep people moving forward. But, you know, the same thing could be said of just your knowledge base, you know, be good, good enough at everything. And then at that point in time, you're going to figure out what you really believe in. And then if need be, you can become a niche specialist at that point. Yeah, that, that, um, that, that makes sense to me getting, um, kind of getting used to everything. I, um, I have a workshop that I, I put together for uh, next month. It's my third of this kind. And I have, there's a total of six uh, instructors and there's a, an herbalist also. So he's going to take us foraging for uh, herbs that support like muscular skeletal health. But when I, uh, <clears throat> and like we're camping out and stuff, it's going to be this really cool thing. And so I like invited these other trainers and they're all different than me. I have like two like ninja warriors, competitive ninja warriors, husband and wife, and um, like a movement generalist. He, he's like a big into Edo Portal, and yeah. um, he's taught at my workshops before. He's taught at both of the other ones. Capoeira guy, and so it's like, yeah, I can show you like all kinds of different stuff, but I'm not better at Capoeira than the Capoeira guy. I'm not better yeah. at, and so I want people to get like, so I invite the instructor and then I say great what are you going to teach you have two classes you have what are you going to do and so I don't like because so I don't want to like get in the way of my own like event and give people so people can have like what they want and like, you're talking like specializing or um, like get good at a bunch of things like the one the ninja warrior George O'Dell 
he was just, I just saw him post a video of doing the salmon ladder with a 70 pound backpack. <laughs> he was not, like, he's just like this powerhouse. He's like about my age. Uh, I'm 39. And so you're talking about like age getting, you know, this is what I'm getting around to. Um, uh, so as I'm like creeping up on 40 years old, and I do martial arts, I do uh, jujitsu, which can, which can be very tough on you, especially if you're competitive. Um, <laughs> and uh, so then I might look like, well, what do I really want to do? Do I, do I really want to be all like really beat up or do I want to like train like just with like people that at least care about me a little bit? They're not going to, or if I'm boxing with somebody and if I take a big hit, that's not their opening to hit me again. That's means stop. So I, so I, people got to kind of like figure out like what they want. So when, when somebody is going towards like 40 and into the fifties, like, what do you say about to keep like improving in all these different ways without um, doing uh, like too much before you get injured? Cause there's like the fine line between like the enough training to get better and then there's right. injury uh injury uh potential i think it comes down to truly looking within yourself and defining your goal it sounds like a cop-out answer but it is so important you know a vast majority of people walking this earth they don't know what the fuck they want out of their lives they don't know what they want out of their training. They just go through their days just in the days. And if you can define what, what truly makes you happy, like, oh my God, I can't wait to do this. Mm -hmm. If you can do that with your training, that becomes your priority. Mm -hmm. But certain things, you know, if walking is your priority, that's really easy. It's like, man, I love walking. I could walk all day and you're not going to have any repercussions from it. Mm -hmm. But you know what? If getting under a thousand pound squat is your thing, you're going to have a lot of work to do to earn the right to continue to do what you love to do. Mm -hmm. If you want to go throw down on the mat seven day a week at BJJ and be competitive at it, you better be earning your right to do it. When you get into some of these more advanced physical situations, essentially sport is what I'm talking about. As soon as it becomes a little bit more competitive, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that that's your means of fitness. It means that you need a means of fitness in order to do your sport. So when you think about it like that, you have to truly define what you're after. You know, would I put a general fitness client uh, that just wants to look and feel and function better under a thousand pound squat, even if they could do it? Like, hell no, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Or would I put somebody, again, that just wants to lose 20 pounds, like, on a six day a week Brazilian Jiu Jitsu schedule that somebody's like arm barring them. Like, no, no, I wouldn't do that. So it really comes down to knowing what you want to do. And as long as you know it, there's always a way it might be hard work, but usually the hard work pays off. If you get the types of feeling that, you know, you and I both feel like when I go in and train, you know, I love it. I love it every single day, but you know, when I invest in my recovery, I invest in my nutrition. I invest in my warm-ups. It's all stuff that, you know, we don't love to do any of that stuff. But when we do it enough that it yields such a high result in terms of making what we love to do better, I think that's a big difference. But, you know, there's certain things that, you know, age is not a disability. I'll, I'll just preface my statement with this. Age is not a disability. Uh, you know, I have a training group right now that our youngest uh, member is 19 years old, a Division I basketball player. Our oldest member is 72, and she is a world champion powerlifter. Awesome. So we're managing people from 19 to 72 right now, about 100 people on the FHT pro team. And we're doing it in such a way that everyone has the same goal, but everyone conceptualizes what it takes to continue on for that goal. And it's something really, really special that you see because the buy-in factors already there. You know, we're talking about advanced trainees that really want to be healthy. They want to be lean. They want to be strong. They want to be mobile. They want to go dominate softball and soccer in the rec leagues. And we can do that. But 
if that's not your goal, then that program wouldn't be appropriate for you or that type of client management wouldn't be appropriate for somebody that you're working with. But I think just making sure that as you get older, you're doing things efficiently. We only have so many bullets in the chamber of our guns physically. You know, we only have so many knee flexions and shoulder flexions and all this stuff. We need to be investing them wisely. More is not always better. That could be said for anybody. Better is better. More results are better. So really just looking at it from a training economy standpoint, from a total volume, from a frequency, from an intensity standpoint, we need to do the homework a little bit better. We need to spend more time and energy preparing not only physically for our training sessions, but mentally. And if we can do that all centered around that goal, then age is a number. That's all it is. It's not a limiting factor anymore. But if we're just pounding ourselves, there's going to be a weakest link that will eventually break. And, you know, we're already, like we started this conversation with, we're already kind of in the position where we're predisposed due to a couple of cultural issues, societal issues, daily posturing issues. We need to be combating that stuff by doing things that we have control of, which is essentially our self-maintenance and our training. Yeah, the, that, that makes a lot of um, sense. Like, like the, I think you put it like is earning the right to squat the thousand pounds or, or whatever it is we're doing. And those little things like maybe it's, you know, putting a little bit more time into the, the warm up when you're getting older and not just be like walking to the gym with your buddy that's half your age. And, uh, and, you know, maybe you'll, kind of like, like show him a little bit like the, yeah, the ego driven stuff, man. Like I could get into that for hours, but I always say it's it, training is about you, not about anybody else. It's a self centered activity. So if you can keep it self centered, if you can keep it centered on you and your goals, then nothing else matters. You know, there's times and places where, um, you know, being pushed out of your comfort zone a little bit is a great thing. That's how we actually optimize performance. But in a day in day out basis, you know, we need to be individualizing and optimizing for the people in front of us, or if it's you for yourself, you know, I would never squat the same as somebody else because they're not the same as me. I need to squat how I need to squat. I need to be doing the mobility drills that help me maintain my mobility. One size fit all doesn't help anybody. What it does is frustrates people and burns them out. So we need to figure out what works for us. And even with all the science out there, you know, I, I spend the better part of every day reading science and N equals one is the most important number that I've ever seen. It's the person that walks in, in front of you. How are you going to optimize and individualize their programming, their client management for them? Not giving them what you want to give them, giving them what they need. There's two, those are two different things. So always know the science, know the research, know the methods out there, but know their limitations as well. Because if an outlier walks in in front of you, if they need something that goes against the, what the, the latest research study says, you know, that's the beauty of being a coach. That's the beauty of being a really savvy athlete or just uh, somebody that wants to take care of their body is, you know your body better than anyone ever could. You know, the clients and the athletes that I manage, they know their body so well. And it's our job to listen to them. But you also be having to listen to yourself. You know, you've lived with yourself for 39 years. I've lived with myself for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. We need to respect that and listen to the things that our body is telling us. If we can do that without overanalyzing, we can give ourselves what we need and make it a more sustainable process. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it is so much individual. I, I think some, there might be like common for a lot of trainers, like the new person comes in and already have your program ready. <laughs> and, and it's, um, you mentioned something before, like, like the certifications and um, like when I'm like looking for somebody to uh, teach a workshop with me, um, it's like if, if the, if I don't know them, like, Oh, he has a master's degree in exercise physiology. Okay. That, that could be really awesome. It, it is awesome. I don't, I don't have one. Uh, but that doesn't really tell me anything. I've seen people with master's degrees 
that don't seem to be able to coach very well. And then, but if you say like, oh, this dude, or I see like on Instagram, this guy's super passionate about old time strongman stuff. I can just see that he is excited to, to teach. And I've had a guy like that. I've had somebody teach at my workshop that was not certified. He was yeah. super passionate, strong, really, and knew his stuff. Um, he was really good. And I, I, didn't, I don't care if he has a degree. Like, he can actually do this stuff. So, I, do, you, do you find the, the same thing? I mean, I don't – sometimes I, I've mentioned that before, and I don't mean to, like, put down school or anything like that, but um, it's almost like – I'm more impressed with, like, like, what kind of certification you have or, like, what are you passionate about and what can you actually do? I, I couldn't agree with you anymore. And coming from a guy that has spent 10 years in the university setting, I've literally written a doctoral dissertation. I can tell you that it does not mean shit. It does not mean shit. When you're thinking about continuing your education, that's like a hot button topic right now in our industry. It's like, oh, con well, continuing education do you have? What certifications do you have? Mm -hmm. Continuing education starts with yourself. Are you currently training passionately for something that literally gets you up in the morning that you want to go and do and chase down and master? That's step one. You are your own first client. Mm -hmm. Step two, do you bring that passion to other people? Are you coaching living, breathing, shitting human beings? Mm -hmm. Are you doing that? That's step two. Mm -hmm. I haven't mentioned a master's or a doctorate level yet. Step three, do you have the knowledge of principles of exercise science, physiology, anatomy, and biomechanics. Again, nothing to do with school credentials, nothing to do with certifications. Do you have the knowledge of principles? Principles are things that never change. Principles are things that if you know, they will never change in your lifetime, my kid's lifetime. They are what we know is true. And then from there, are you actually getting results with all this stuff you're doing? Are you getting results? Are your clients getting results? Are your principles growing your knowledge base? Then ask me about your certifications. Then ask me about your education. What university did you go to? Do you have a doctorate? You know what? 99% of people can't make it through level one or level two of that kind of BS detector, I call it. Mm. They're not training themselves and they're not training anybody. I don't give a shit if you have a PhD, if you're not doing those two things. I do not care. The best coaches that I know, I have the fortunate opportunity to be around them on a weekly basis all around the world. The best coaches that I know are passionate. They're training themselves. They're working their ass off with their clients. They're loving every second. And you know what? They love it so much that they're going home and studying. Yeah. They're going and investing in weekend uh, seminars. I didn't say certification, I said like seminars, like shit that you really love. If you yeah. can do that, man, education doesn't matter. And that's coming from somebody again, who has literally torched a decade of their life in the university system. Um, you know, I know that there's certain advantages to that stuff, sure. but I would always challenge somebody, hey, should I, I get this question all the time, hey, I'm a personal trainer, um, should I go get a master's degree? Hey, what's your goal? Oh, I really just want to train people and I want to train athletes. Are you doing that right now? Yeah. Continue to do that and be the best coach you could possibly be. Or the second question, Hey, I want to be like you, John, like you're awesome. Like you're training all these athletes. You're, you know, training Dave Tate, all these famous power lifters. Like, do I need a doctorate in physical therapy to do this? And I'm like, no, it will actually probably hurt you more than it will help you at this point. So it's always aligning your goals, your professional goals. But it starts with the basic things that, honestly, people, they, they overlook. You know, we get resume after resume after resume on a weekly basis about internships or shadowing opportunities. You know, hey, I got a master's, I have a doctorate in physical therapy, and I'm in PhD studies. My first question, what does your training look like? Oh, no, I don't have time to train. I'm in school. <laughs> All right, see ya. Or the second one, hey, uh, do you train yourself? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, okay, cool. Are you training anybody right now? No. Why? Um, so I always make the same recommendation. Train yourself. And you know what? You don't even have to be paid for training people. Go volunteer your time and then start to accrue some experience. Experience, a trainer that has experience 
that's a powerful, powerful professional in our field. Um, and then we see the turnaround in our field of 16 to 18 months is the average amount of time that a personal trainer or a strength coach spends in the fitness industry. So we have green, newbie, 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 newbie coming through. So a veteran coach, you can differentiate yourself very quickly just knowing your shit, knowing the foundations, being passionate. You know, living a life that you would try to teach your clients. You know, it's simple stuff, but the simplest stuff becomes the most effective stuff. Yeah, that's really cool. It's, it's cool to hear you say that too. You know, somebody that does have the, have the education and um, the, you know, the, but to say, that this other stuff matters more like what you can actually do. Like the guy with the master's degree that doesn't work out, but he wants to teach, he wants to coach uh, the some NFL players and stuff. It's like, well, that, that's, that's kind of a, that's kind of a weird one. And, and, uh, and like, so I, I started as a trainer in 1999, I was about 20 years old. And I didn't go to college at all. At, at, like shortly after high school, I started studying to be a personal trainer. And I had my dream job uh, at 20 years old. And so it's like, I always kind of felt like maybe a little bit bad about not going to, to college because it's like I, I can see how it, it could help. But it was like, I'm already doing what I wanted to, to do. So like, what is that going to do except cost me money and time and I'm going to be sitting in like some advanced math class burning my brain out and, and I'm not going to use that to, for what I, what I want. So it's very true. So I'll, I'll give you this story. When I moved out to Southern California, I took my first job after graduating uh, physical therapy school. So I coached throughout uh, the four years of physical therapy school, but ended taking up a job in Southern California. And, you know, I had this ground from the bottom up here, you know, I was making less than $20 an hour in Southern California, which is really tough to live on. Mm -hmm. And I was literally training people. I was running boot camps. Uh, I was doing a tiny bit of physical therapy, but my boss was not in that day. He was sick one day and I was sitting on the ground. It was 6 a.m. because I used to get up and I used to train myself at 4.30 a.m. before 6 a.m. clients would come in. And you know what? I didn't have a 6 a.m. client that day. I just happened to be cooling down on the foam roller on the gym floor and an MLB all pro walks in. This dude is like the shit. You know, he's the top athlete at this gym. He works with my boss. Hmm. Walks in. Oh, man. Hey, he's sick today. Uh, you don't have to train today. He's sick. He'd probably be better tomorrow. He's like, no, man, I want to train. Who else is around? And the front lady, the front desk lady goes, Hey, John's back there. He's not doing anything. He doesn't have a 6 a.m. Who's John? I wasn't a physical therapist at that point. I wasn't a strength coach at that point. The thing that made the biggest difference to this guy was, Hey, John's an X division one baseball player. You know, he was a stud and this baseball dude's like, Oh shit. John was a baseball player. Walks right back. We do one session. After that one session, I never lost that client. Wow. That single guy gave me every referral in a matter of a six month period that he had. I was fully booked with NFL and MLB players at that point, And I was fresh out of school at that point. Mm. But as I got in, you know, my in was being one of them. You know, I practiced what I preached. If I wanted to train baseball players, I was a baseball player. You know, there's more to it than that, but people don't care about the education. They, they care about feeling good about, working with somebody and that was the biggest break I ever had but I was in the fucking gym I was sitting on a foam roller because I trained you know 15 minutes before that mm -hmm. and I was there at the right time the right place with the right opportunity and really the rest is history you know that was in 2010 and <laughs> a lot's changed since then but based off of that one opportunity of John being the baseball guy um, everything else just lined up, but you know, education mattered at that point, you know, a couple of years later where people are really seeking it out and experience mattered at that point. But the initial spark of everything had nothing to do with anything other than me being there with a sweat on my face. The guy had been seen me in the gym train before like, Oh, this guy knows what he's doing because he's training himself and me being a baseball guy. So yeah, you know, all this other stuff, it matters, 
but it doesn't matter as much as having experience and being passionate and doing what you love to do and doing it on a daily basis and getting experience with yourself. Yeah, that's really cool. There, there is something about, um, like, uh, I mean, like, like stories. And I, I see like, uh, you know, people want, like, you know, like, how did, how did you meet your wife? How did you meet this person? Or how did you, and a lot of times it's like these almost uh, like meant to be kinds of things like the universe was uh, uh, just working in your, in your favor, like you're, yeah. and so that, that's really cool that that could happen. And like the, it's like, if you uh, like just keep working at it, you're like, they'll say like, you know, maybe it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. And you, you hear that right. sometimes or, or like, uh, so that's, that's really neat that it happened for you that, that way. I always say, you know, everyone's always trying to map out like, oh, you have your overriding goal. You kind of know where you want to be, but you have no idea how to get there. All you got to do is move in the right direction and then opportunities are going to lead your path. Opportunities are going to tell you whether you make a left or a right. You know, <laughs> 10 years ago, if you said that I'd be sitting on a podcast today talking about pain-free training, uh, I would think I was crazy, you know, because I was all a high performance model, but you know, with my experience, my background, my history, and then the opportunities more than anything, all those things synergizing together, they come out with where you end up. And sometimes you don't choose your path. Your path gets chosen for you if you're prepared for your opportunities. And like, that's the best advice I could give to any, anyone, a trainer, a athlete, just people that want to move, feel and function better is, Keep on moving in the right direction. Move there consistently and be prepared for having that big break. Yeah, that, that's really great advice. Be, be ready for when opportunity knocks. Or, um, so what, what do you see is like next for you? Is there something in the um, training world that you've like been thinking of adding to your program or – What's, uh, what do you see as like on the, on the horizon, the next level for you? This is hard to answer because um, two and a half years ago, I was, I was coaching 60 plus hours a week still in the gym. You know, uh, I had the fortunate opportunity in 2014 to start writing content for T Nation. And that's kind of how I got my name out there in the industry. But since then, I've spent the vast majority of the time training. Uh, it's only been two and a half years when we're doing, you know, media, I'm posting on Instagram, uh, I'm going doing seminars and that kind of stuff. But everything this year really just came to a head. Um, you know, I talked to my wife about this. It's how lucky am I? Uh, <laughs> I have clients like Dave Tate. You know, I get to work with Dave Tate as a client. Like, oh my God, pinch me right now. How much better does it get than that? And then, you know, I get to do a mega product for bodybuilding.com, the biggest site on earth. And I get to talk about pain-free training in front of 5 million people. Like, where do you go from there? And I get to stand in front of 50, if not 100 passionate coaches every month and present my seminars. Like, how much better does it get than that? So, you know, right now, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, the newest thing for me is just trying to optimize things and do things better. One of the most exciting things that I have, I mentioned it, it's, uh, it's called the FHT Pro Team. It's essentially my individualized coaching program. And when I say individualized coaching, I don't mean individualized programming. So for people that have the right goals, they're the right training age, uh, you know, they don't have injuries, this program is by far the most effective thing that I've ever done. You know, the reason I made a name for myself in the industry is essentially programming, programming and coaching. So getting back to that a little bit more, uh, you know, we have about 70 passionate members in the FHT Pro Team. We have people training and doing world-class things on a daily basis for the right reasons. And I'm bridging it into an education platform as well. So I'm having live webinars happening almost on a weekly basis. I, I just did one two days ago with Dr. Chad Waterbury for our members and stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's awesome. You know, I'm not a huge believer in individualized programming with remote deliveries like online coaching, but I think uh, having us opened up this system of 
really just trying to get the best of both worlds, having a really unique program, having me coaching people on a daily basis, but having the longevity to get to know people because you're coaching them for six months, a year, two years at a time. And these are fitness professionals as well. That's been the best payoff for me. You know, coaching Dave Tate's cool, the bodybuilding.com stuff's cool, the seminars are awesome, but really truly getting to know a couple individuals and making a huge impact on their lives and the way that they train their clients. It's been the most rewarding thing of the year. Uh, and this year has been unbelievable. So moving into next year, I, I just see so much growth from that happening just because I am so passionate about it. Uh, you know, I get up every day and that's the thing that really drives me right now. You know, I love teaching. I love educating. I love training. We're essentially doing all three of those things on one platform now, and it's something that you know the results speak for itself on. So it, it's an online thing that you're doing. So like people are all part of this. So the the 72 year old woman and 19 year old, um, it's it's all part of this online thing. Yes. And then you're doing yes. the webinars, and that, that's really that's really a cool way to. It's awesome because, um, so I look at myself as an avatar for this FHT protein. I'm not huge. I'm not super lean. I'm not super strong. I'm not super mobile. I'm kind of like in the middle ground of everything. So I'm uh, an interesting person to program from because it's a very generalized program for me. And we try to target people that are essentially like that. But the individualized coaching that happens, I'm able to coach each and every person on a daily basis with video, with calls, with webinars, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of time that goes into it. But it's time that I love spending. Yeah, I, I keep uh, like kind of rethinking of what my uh, future in the training world will be. It's it's great. I, I really like working with kids and. Uh, and so I have like a kids class and adult classes, one-on-one -on -one clients, of course. And I was, you know, trying to like think of like, well, what, what's the future of all this training? Like what, what's like a little bit different. And so there's, um, I think like what, what you're talking about does sound like different than uh, um, what anybody else is really doing. Maybe the other people are doing like similar. Yeah. There's online training stuff, but, like you know what? No, you, don't, you haven't heard of it because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Um, but if that's your thing, if you love doing it, then it doesn't, it is not work. Uh, everyone else is trying to sell this, this shyster model of, hey, come be an individualized online coaching client with me. I'm going to give you your perfect program. And then they end up just sending the same program to everybody. I can't stand that. So what we're trying to do is say, hey, I'm dialing in the best programming that I can possibly come up with on a weekly basis. Every single training session is going to be different, but intelligently different, not randomized different, but with a periodized program. And I'm going to coach you every day and educate you every day. Um, it's a viral thought process, but I think a lot of people are shying away from it because it's this mindset of like, oh, I'm a business owner, like four hour work week, bro. Like, I don't want to work hard. I just want to make money. It's not about that. Mm -hmm. If you're passionate about what you're doing, you're going to work your ass off no matter what. It's about being as efficient and helping as many people as possible, impacting people's lives. And, you know, the carryover of our 70 people, you know, 55 of them right now are trainers. They're using a lot of these methods, a lot of their continuing education from this platform with 100, if not 200 of their clients. So, you know, viral thought processes that move very, very quickly, you know, with that trickle down effect. Yeah. The, I think a lot of people that are looking into like the online training thing, they see like maybe the ad for like passive income and <laughs> I've seen, you know, it's like, I got to laugh at that, man. Mm -hmm. Anyone who knows anyone who's done it the right way, you know, that has some moral compass, some ethical compass on what they're doing as a fitness professional knows it takes three to four times as long to coach somebody online as it does in person. Yeah. This isn't like, oh yeah, I can just like take on all these clients and I can make all this money and it's all passive. <laughs> no, like it's far harder, but people don't do it a good job and it turns it into a business and it doesn't help anybody. So if you're not helping anybody, like what the hell are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your profession? What are you doing with your career? There is no career in that. 
Yeah, I've seen some with like uh, like one of them was saying like she's like trying to sell something like for online thing and like you have like a Facebook group so you don't have to answer their questions. Somebody else from the group can answer the questions. Like that doesn't make sense. Why do you want somebody else answering their question if you're the one that's supposed to be the right figurehead of this thing and, and know what's going on and have, having somebody else that's just an, another student answering the question is so yeah they having the, the it's qualities in everything and you know if you're willing to put your reputation on the line and give somebody a shit product and get them shit results then go ahead and do it and i hope you cash out a lot of money because you're never going to be working in this industry again but you know if you can put the time in if you can get people results and if you can really over deliver it's always about over delivering whatever you do you want people to think this is the best training session that i've ever done this is the best week of training that i've ever seen that was the best webinar that i've ever seen this is the best seminar i'm so happy i paid and invested in myself coming into this seminar that's what i'm after uh <laughs> you know there's a lot of different ways to make money in this world but if you can't do it with some sort of ethics then I don't know how people sleep at night. You know, having two kids at home, that's what my wife and I try to teach our kids is, yeah, we're hustling, we're grinding, we're trying to run a great business here. You know, we have three different businesses right now, but we're doing it the right way. We're trying to really help people. And, you know, it sounds super cliche. Everyone's trying to help people, but I think from our actions, our actions mean more than our words, especially to like my eight-year-old daughter who sees us, you know, maybe on the phone or me flying out every single weekend, not knowing exactly what I'm doing, but then sees people come into us and the kind of relationships that we build when they come into our facility in Madison that, you know, they're strong relationships and it's something that, you know, it's earned. Yeah. And like what you say about like your, yeah, like clients, like the, the regular clients, but you're like coaching coaches also. And then, so your, um, um, your, your philosophy and your, your skills get passed down and just spreads out. And, and um, like, I, I can, I like doing that also. I te teach other coaches that have, yeah. or, or bring people up to be coaches. Like there's uh, like one of my students, she, uh, she just turned 14 and uh, she's been with me for like a little over a year, her and her brother. And so I, I was talking about like the workshops and, and stuff. And it was like, you're on, cause I've had like a um, level one I past like my level one kettlebell. Um, and she passed that and her brother passed and they were the only ones that passed. All the other kids were like halfway to passing. And I was like, you're on the, the track. I was like, I, I would, it may not be too long until I would hire you. <laughs> to teach something and she's she's 14 so yeah um like and she's about to like start like teaching um some karate she has her junior black belt in karate and so she's like this dedicated smart young lady and like i, I was telling about how much you could make for an hour if i can come to one of my workshops it's like i might pay you 85 dollars for an hour <laughs> yeah and like for a 14 year old that's that's really, yeah. and uh, so I was like, you know, think about that. And um, so when you're, I guess um, I've had you on for about an, an hour. We, we can kind of start to uh, uh, wrap it up here. I could just talk, uh, talk shop with you for all, all night. But uh, I guess like what, what kind of, th is there anything else you're wanting to get into or like what other like words of advice do you have for other trainers or you know, just put in the work, you know, don't be afraid to work hard. Our industry is telling us one thing, you, you got to zig when everyone else is zagging. You know, when everyone's trying to take the easy way, you got to take the hard way. You know, it's not a badge of honor to kill yourself doing something, but you do got to work hard. Mm -hmm. You, know, you got to put in those split shifts. You, you got to get the experience. But if you can do that, you weed yourself out from all of the shit and you build yourself up into what we were talking about before, which is the veteran coach. There's always going to be room for more veteran coaches in our fitness industry. And having somebody that can be a real-time problem solver, something that is developed over time, 
that should be every trainer, every fitness professional's goal is to be the go-to guy that can do it when it comes to training your athletes and training your clients. Mm -hmm. So, you know, keep the focus. Don't worry about the superficial stuff happening on Instagram. You know, don't get caught up in needing a doctorate level education before you got the experience. You know, put your head down and just keep on doing good work and good things will happen. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Put in, put in the work. It's, um, I think more and more people are looking for like the easy way these, these days. And that passive income sure sounds nice. You can just wake up at noon and check your bank account. And, but, uh, yeah, well, uh, thanks for coming on. And, um, yeah, you have open invitation to be on again. So if people want to, um, get a hold of you, check out your seminars and your, uh, this, this group training that you're doing online, how do they find you? Over on my website, everything's there. So it's drjohnrussin.com, D-R-J-O-H-N-R-U-S-I-N.com. You know, you can check out our FHT program over there. We have our, our seminar links. I'm headed to Seattle in September, and then we are about to make a big announcement for our last uh, event of the year, which is going to be somewhere in the Midwest in December. So, um, depending when this goes out, you know, that might be live. So yeah, check out everything. If you guys want to get a hold of me, you can always hit me up on the contact form. We get back to every email, just, just reference the podcast and, uh, tell me who you are and then I'll answer anything that you got. Yeah. Very cool. Well, uh, thanks again for, uh, coming on and, uh, I'm going to, I'll stop the recording and I'll talk to you for just a second after uh, I hit stop. Sounds good, man.